Hi, I'm Bill Geisley of Geisley Automatics. Today I'm going to try to answer a qu common question that our customers have. How to choose a Geisley trigger? We manufacture approximately 15 or so different types of triggers. And I'm going to try to provide some guidance on how to bet choose the best one for your application. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself and how this company got started. Um, my experience is as, a, is as a mechanical engineer. I worked in the mining industry and the railway industry. And in 2004, I decided to make a trigger for national match high power shooting. I was a high power competitor at the time and I really struggled uh, with, the, with the kind of triggers that were out there at that time. I'd practice and practice uh, my offhand and I'd get to a match and my trigger would go south. And all my practice that, I've, that I had done for months on end uh, was basically, uh, would basically go up and smoke at the 600 yard line as my trigger would lose its second stage. And I worked all day long with castings and forgings and weldments in the railway industry. I ran a design department and I had four engineers and technicians that I supervised in order to manufacture components for track. So it was a natural extension of what I did in, in my day job in order to make a trigger. And in 2004, I designed the high speed national match trigger. I took it to Camp Perry in 2004 and had the good fortune to be squatted with a shooter with the Army Marksmanship Unit. I showed him my trigger. He said, you know what, that's pretty cool. He said, why don't you take that over to the truck and show Mr. Clark. So I took it over to the AMU tractor trailer that comes out on the range that has basically a movable gun shop and weapon repair shop in this trailer and they use it to support all the Army shooters. And I went up to the truck and I asked for Mr. Clark and Gene Clark, who is the head gunsmith of the AMU, said, hey, yeah, he told me about this trigger. Our shooter told me about this trigger. Let me see it. And he started checking it out. And the first thing that he said was, what hammer spring does it use? And I said, well, it's our own design, but it basically mimics the torque of the GI M16A1 hammer spring. And he said, good because we'll never use any type of a hammer in any of our weapons that doesn't have a full power hammer spring. And he started to go into all the testing that they've done with triggers with compromised hammer springs and the decrease in accuracy with these compromised ha hammer springs. Then he went into their bolt guns and how a compromised striker will pose problems with vertical stringing with their, with their with their bolt guns that the AMU shoots. And as he was checking it out, the commander of the Army Marksmanship Unit came up to the truck, uh, Colonel Luwanek, and he said, hey, Commander, come and take a look at this. And Commander Luwanek came over and he, 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 he looked at the trigger and he said, that's just what we need. Well, I didn't know what they were talking about, but at that time, they, the Army Marksmanship Unit was working on an R&D project for the infantry board at Fort Benning and it was for a 762 semi-automatic sniper weapon. This is what we know now as the, the SAS semi-automatic sniper system. And the AMU built six proof of concept guns for the infantry board to prove this concept out. They, they used AR-10 platforms and they needed a good trigger for it. And they used our service rifle trigger in these guns. So the first SAS weapons, first prototypes, had a Geisley trigger in them. I kept making triggers for the, for the national match circuit and many more competitors started using our trigger. It was, it was very reliable, it was completely adjustable, has the fastest lock time of any trigger out there. It has the trigger bow move forward 3 16 of an inch to reduce finger crowding. And in 2006, I received a phone call from a, an organization in the U.S. Special Operations community, and they asked me, can you make a combat trigger that's as good as your national match trigger for us? And I started developing one for it. 
They had made this phone call because there was an issue with the current triggers that they had been using. They were using another type of match trigger. They weren't using a mil-spec trigger. And in an armored vehicle, one of the weapons equipped with this trigger had a trigger failure and the weapon started to shoot on its own in this armored vehicle without anybody's finger near the trigger. And it fired two rounds in the armored vehicle before the shooter had a chance to drop the magazine. After the shooter dropped the magazine, of course, the gun stopped firing. And by a miracle, the only thing that happened was one of the rounds hit the suppressor of somebody else's weapon. So through this failure, they saw that, that this trigger that they were using was inherently unsafe. A part had broken in the trigger and it started to shoot. So we developed, in response to their, their requirements, the SSF, Super Select Fire. This trigger is for the M4 carbine, M16 rifle, and we have a version for the HK416 rifle. It's a non-adjustable combat trigger. However, it has a two-stage pull that is tuned for combat conditions. It's tuned so that in a stressful situation, when fine motor skills degrade, the trigger can still be controlled. From this trigger, the SSF, that was adopted in 2007 by organizations in the Department of Defense, we made a semi-automatic version, our SSA. This trigger has the same tuning as the SSF. It is not a crisp, light trigger. It's approximately four and a half pounds. The break on the second stage is like a carrot. It's not like an icicle. It's not like a candy cane. And you need this carrot-like break in order to control the trigger in a stressful situation. So from these, from these three triggers, we now have about 16 or so. Some of them are for specialized guns, like the SCAR. We make a trigger specifically for that weapon. We make triggers for the HK416 and HK417 weapons that have a unique firing pin safety that needs to be lifted up uh, by the hammer in order for these weapons to operate. We make uh, a hammer, a US-made hammer, for the Benelli semi-automatic shotguns. For the AR-15, we have approximately 12 triggers. First, when you're choosing a trigger, you have to understand who made your lower receiver. It's either a Colt or non-Colt. If it's a Colt, you have to measure your hammer and trigger pin size. From approximately the late 1980s up until the fall of 2009, Colt made trigger and hammer pins that were slightly larger, a 64th of an inch larger than the mill stock diameter specification. Mill stock pins are approximately 0.154 in diameter. The Colt pins are approximately 0.169. And Colt did this because at one time they thought that people were going to take M16 fire control parts and put them in an AR-15 and convert it into an automatic weapon. You really can't do that. Um, there are, you know, there are extra things that need to be done to the weapon in order to do that. You can't just take an M16 fire control group, put it in an AR-15 and have a select fire weapon. It doesn't work that way. But they had different things in place in their weapons in order to prevent this. They had the bolt carrier cut back. They had something called a sear block in their weapon, which was a block that was pinned in place that would prevent an M16 trigger from being installed. And the other thing they did is they took their, their trigger and hammer pins and made them a 64th of an inch larger. If you have a Colt, on our website is a document, a guide for Colt rifle users. And this describes the Colt triggers, their pin sizes, different types of uh, the sear blocks that it goes into the different types of sear blocks that cold is used over over time and which one of our triggers will fit what colt rifle on some of them the sear block has to be removed on other ones the sear block can stay stay in place we don't make all of our triggers in the large pin colt version 
we make the SSA, the SSAE, our high speed triggers, all in the large, in the large pin. But on our super dynamic versions, for instance, uh, we, don't, we don't make a large pin trigger. So if you have a Colt, download that document, review it, measure your pin size. We have seen one Colt that had a large pin hammer and a small pin trigger. So both pins have to be measured in order for you to be sure of what pin size you have. If you don't have a Colt, you can use any of our small pin triggers. Small pin does not mean a substandard pin. It just means a mill, stock, a mill standard pin diameter, 0.154. If you have a registered M4 carbine, M16, the SSF trigger is the one that you want to choose. This has the capability to fire semi-automatically and full automatically in those weapons. The SSF is not for an AR-15 or any other semi-automatic rifle that uses the AR-15 style triggers. The SSF is only for true select fire M4 carbines and M16 rifles. If you have an AR-15 and now you, you, we've narrowed down the type of triggers that, that you're going to look at. You're not going to look at the SSF. You're not going to look at the large pin triggers. You have to think about the type of shooting that you're doing. If you're doing long range precision shooting, the trigger that you want to look at is our national match high speed line of triggers. That's what they're geared for. They're fully adjustable. You can adjust the first stage weight, you can adjust the second stage weight, you can adjust the sear engagement, and you can adjust the over travel. They have a very fast lock time, four milliseconds. That's in comparison to a Remington 700 bolt gun, which is slightly under two milliseconds. It's extremely fast. A mil spec trigger is approximately nine to 10 milliseconds. Our combat triggers, like the SSA, are approximately five milliseconds. So the high speed is, has the fastest lock time. The hammer is also tuned in its geometry to reduce the reaction at the hammer pin by the use of a sweet spot on the strike face that hits the firing pin. In other words, it's like a baseball bat when you hit a baseball and you hit it in a sweet spot. You feel no reaction in your hands when you hit that baseball. If you hit it off the sweet spot, you'll feel a sting in your hands. And that's what we've eliminated, or I shouldn't say eliminated, reduced in the high speed hammer. We've tuned that sweet, sweet spot to be in line with the firing pin axis. So this way, when the, when the hammer hits, it does not put a reaction into the gun that can disturb your sights. It's due to the unique shake, shape of the, of the high speed hammer. Um, and for long range shooting, the high speed is the ticket. It will allow you to tune your trigger the way you want it. Whether you want that second stage brake to be lighter or heavier, to be absolutely crisp, or to be deadened somewhat, it's a simple adjustment with a set screw. The adjustments on the high speed do not come out of, do not come out of adjustment. Once they're set, they're in place. You don't, do not have to go back in there with Loctite and try to re-Loctite everything. It's a straightforward procedure. There's videos on YouTube where I show how to install a high-speed trigger. But again, it does require adjustment. And because of that adjustment, some shooters are uncomfortable with an adjustable trigger in their firearm. I think a lot of that is from uh, previous triggers that were adjustable that came out of adjustment or that never really were correctly where the adjustment was used as an excuse for sloppy tolerances in the manufacturing process. Some shooters may not want the bow move forward 3 16ths of an inch. It all depends upon what your level of, of comfort is with adjustability and a slightly different trigger bow than the standard M4 profile. But if you're shooting long range, if you're shooting precise, if you have a, a gun that's intended for precision shooting, the national match high speed trigger, whether it's in match, which is our lightest, the DMR, which is our middle 
tactical weight range or our heaviest weight range, the service rifle, either one of those three triggers is your choice. They are the exact same trigger except for the spring set that changes the range of the weight adjustment. The way the springs are designed, you cannot go from the match, which you can get down to an under a two pound first stage and a four to six ounce break all the way up to the service rifle where you can bring that up to a five and a half pound trigger with approximately a 1.3 pound break. We're not able to do that with one spring set. It has to be changed throughout those weight ranges. If you decided that the high speed may not be for you, then we can look at our non-adjustable triggers. These are all based on the design of the SSF, the Super Select Fire. However, they do not have the capability and the geometry on the trigger capable of shooting select fire. They will only shoot semi-automatic only. We start with three triggers that we have that have a curved bow, just like the M4 carbine. It has the exact trigger profile. If you pick up a stock trigger and you pick up an SSA, an SSAE, or a Super 3 gun, it will feel exactly the same as a stock trigger. We also have a line of straight trigger bows. These are straight, and what that does is a straight trigger bow makes your pull weight feel approximately a pound lighter than what it actually is. That's why we have those. We're also coming out with a different trigger bow in the beginning of 2013. It's going to be called our Super T, Super Tricon. This trigger profile was recommended to me by Jeff Gonzalez of Trident Concepts. It's basically starts out as a curved M4 and then it straightens out. The bow has the curve shape where you put your finger. It's not flat across it. It's curved just like an M4. But the bow is curved and it has a roughened surface. To be, and it's designed for gloves, shooting with gloves that may be wet at the time. So we have these different areas of our, of our, uh, of our non-adjustable combat triggers and we'll start with the curved bow version. SSA, super semi-automatic. This trigger is a combat two stage. It's approximately four and a half pounds. The break on the second stage is about a pound and a half, and it breaks like a carrot. This is designed for, for situations where you may be stressed out and your fine motor skills degrade. However, this trigger is probably an ex is, and this trigger is an excellent trigger for just about everybody. It does everything well. Even though I say it breaks like a carrot, that's a relative term. It's relative to the break on the high speed and on our enhanced triggers, which are extremely crisp. Most people who get the SSA, look at it and they pick it up and they say, this is an awesome trigger. Yes, it breaks like a carrot, but this is a pretty darn sharp carrot. We have an SSA-E. The SSA-E is an enhanced version of the SSA. It's lighter and it's crisper. The first stage is lighter, the second stage is lighter, and the break is crisper. It breaks like a candy cane. It's approximately a three and a half pound trigger. The second stage break is approximately 1.1 pounds. This is designed for a shooter who wants a non-adjustable trigger, and he's but it has a precision aspect to it. It has a long range aspect to it. If you want a non-adjustable trigger and you're, you have a, a precision gun, the SSA is a good choice. The third trigger in our standard curve bow line is called the Super 3 gun. This was designed specifically for three gun shooting where speed is paramount to extreme precise accuracy. The SSF trigger, when it's switched to automatic, the, 
pull is no longer a two stage. It is a single stage pull, but it is a pull that is long and it's like a plateau. Your trigger comes up and it's perfectly smooth and then the weapon discharges multiple rounds. It's a unique shooting experience shooting in automatic with the SSF. In the M4 carbine, I can control an M4 carbine about 80% of the time. I can fire one round on automatic. Two rounds are on command. Three rounds, you actually have to work to fire three rounds with it. Just a short press, and you have two rounds going down range. It's completely controllable. And I found that pull, that automatic pull, to be a very unique pull. It kind of tricks you into not expecting the shot. You start pulling back the trigger, it glides back. It's kind of like a Glock trigger on ball bearings, and then the weapon discharges. It sort of tricks you into not flinching, keeping your eyes open on the shot. We've combined a shorter version of that automatic pull with a very, very fast reset and a pull weight of approximately three pounds. The Super 3 gun, or S3G, is not a single stage trigger, even though some shooters consider it to be. I don't consider it to be one. I consider it to be a hybrid trigger. Your pull weight increases and it starts moving backwards, very smooth, and then the weapon discharges. You may consider that plateau to be creep. Creep is objectionable. Creep is jerky. You can, it, it's an objectionable trigger pull. That smooth pull is not objectionable. Shooters who are looking for accuracy or who are shooting groups or are doing bench rest do not find the S3G trigger to be for them. It takes a little bit of work in order to get accuracy out of the Super 3 gun trigger. Can be done. It's just, it's just a learning curve. It's not designed for precise shooting. On a two-stage trigger, you pull all the slack out of the trigger on a true two-stage. You have a large sear engagement, you bring it down to a small sear engagement, and then just a slight more pressure, and the weapon discharges. That's the beauty of a two-stage trigger. You have safety, reliability, forgiveness, and performance in one package. As soon as you move to a single stage trigger, you give something up. A performance single stage trigger is not forgiving. It's not forgiving when you're running around with a loaded weapon that you might be doing in the military or if you're a police officer or you're using it in a carbine course. It's a performance single stage trigger is not forgiving. It's all, I've, a lot, most of the single stage trigger that are performance do not have the reliability and do not have the safety of a two stage trigger. Two stage trigger, you can have your cake and eat it too. However, in three gun shooting, a lot of the three gunners, they like a single stage trigger, they're used to it, so we made a super three gun for them. It can be shot very quickly with its short reset and with the first stage pull weight being very close to the weight that it's trying to return your finger. It can be shot extremely fast. We now look at the flat bow triggers. The flat bow triggers are exactly like the SSA, the SSAE, and a Super 3 gun, except they have a straight bow and it's flat across it. These are our super dynamic line. We have the super dynamic combat, just like our SSA. Super Dynamic Enhanced, SDE, just like our Super Semi-Automatic Enhanced. Then we have an SD3G, Super Dynamic 3-Gun, which is the fastest shooting trigger made today. I mentioned about the Super T trigger, the Super Tricon. That is a unique trigger. It is probably going to be only offered in an SSA version, a combat version, because that's what it's designed for. Again, this is a trigger bow that some shooters will probably find very appealing. But I always have two rules of triggers, and it's important to understand this. Triggers are relative. They're relative to just about anything that 
a human being can, can come up with. They're relative to the shooter who started shooting small bore with ant shoots bolt action rifles or shooting air gun with Walther air guns with ounce triggers. They're relative to the shooter who never really shot before and who only knows the M16 and the terrible trigger that's in that gun. As soon as you give him slight, something slightly better, he thinks that trigger's great. The shooter who's been shooting small bore and shooting air gun, you're gonna have to work real hard to make that shooter happy. It's relative to your experience. So the type of bow, the type of trigger that the shooter chooses is his choice. And everybody's different. Just because your buddy says, hey, I like the, the Super 3 gun, it's a great trigger, look how fast I can shoot it, I love it, it may not be for you. We have a sister company, it's called ALG Defense, it's owned by my wife. Geisley manufactures a mil-spec trigger for ALG Defense. ALG Defense was set up to have a different product line than Geisley. Now, if all of Geisley's triggers are meant to replace a mil-spec trigger, why in the world would you even make a mil-spec style trigger? And the answer is price. An SSA costs $210. The G2S, which is an SSA that's made a little bit differently, different precise investment castings, a different way of holding the hammer pin in, doesn't have the nice laser marking of the SSA, costs $165. The G2S is essentially an SSA equivalent, but it's made a little bit less expensive. It has the same reliability. It uses the same quality tool steel construction. Their sears are still EDM cut. It's just made differently. And I should have mentioned that before in all our in, in our trigger discussion here. It's called the Geisley two-stage. That's $165. The SSA, which is safety certified by Crane Naval Surface Warfare Center, is $210. The ALG triggers are $45 and $65. That's the reason a shooter would look at the ALG, ALG triggers. There's two triggers in the ALG line. The QMS, quality mill spec. Geisley purchases castings from the same supplier of mill spec triggers to coal. These are the same triggers that are used in the M4 carbine today. We take the semi-automatic castings, not the full automatic ones, and we polish the sear surfaces here and inspect the sear surfaces under a microscope. We then meet a trigger and a hammer that has the sear surfaces polished but not the geometry changed with a quality disconnector made out of mil spec 1070 steel properly os tempered which is a type of heat treatment process that gives a very tough component after it's after it's been os tempered we then made that with a set of mil spec stainless steel springs trigger hammer disconnector or stainless steel we then use quality geisley pins made out of chromoly steel that have been turned, quenched, tempered, and centerless ground to a very precise diameter. They're not the soft steel of a, of a, of a, of a mil spec trigger. We combine these into a package where the shooter knows he's getting quality components with a pull that's better than mil spec, but it's not a match quality pull. The QMS is a smoothed up mil spec trigger made from quality components. It is not a match trigger. It's not free from creep, even though it's a very snappy pull. And it costs $45. There's another version of the QMS it's called the ACT, ALG Combat Trigger. The ACT is essentially the QMS that has been plated with nickel boron and nickel teflon. What this does is it provides a very corrosion resistant surface, but it also provides a little bit of a snappier pull to the trigger. The trigger is nickel boron, which is extremely hard. The hammer and disconnector 
and the pins are nickel Teflon coated. The reason we do different type, two different types of coating is that with this differential coating, the pull is much smoother than if you had nickel boron running on nickel boron. Two different types of coating together makes a much snappier pull. Again, it's not a match trigger. It is not a crisp trigger because the geometry of the mil spec trigger hasn't been changed. Changing the geometry of a mil spec trigger makes it unreliable. It's not really feasible to take a mil spec trigger, modify the sear geometry, and have a 100% across the board reliable light trigger. Even if you did do that, it would be a single stage where your forgiveness isn't there. So the ALG triggers are approximately the same weights, lower than a mil-spec trigger, but they're both approximately six pounds. Mil-spec triggers, you can have triggers that are unshootable, semi-okay, okay, that's about it. Unshootable, semi-okay, and okay. With the ALG triggers, you take away the unshootable triggers, the semi-okay, and you're left with an okay trigger. And this is done at a very good price point. $45 for the QMS, $65 for the ALG trigger. Um, I hope I've been able to, to, to shed some light on Geisley's products today. If you have any questions at all about your choice of triggers, it's extremely in easy to get a personal answer. Email Geisley through our website or at sales at geisley.com or just give the shop a call and you can talk to a technician. We do not have any customer service employees here at Geisley Automatics. The phone is answered by somebody who's actually assembling triggers or working on triggers. These are the people who live and breathe triggers every day. You are not going to get somebody who is disassociated with the manufacturer or shooting aspect of the trigger. Somebody who answers your phone call is going to walk away from their assembly bench but they're there to help you in case you have any questions. Thanks for watching this today and I appreciate your time. And again, just remember guys, the automatics and our motto, which is we manufacture confidence. Thank you.